Um, question. Yeah, so you mentioned, uh, Michael mentioned, I think the average cost was $3 million uh, to litigate. And maybe, Michael, you have this data. What's, what's that broken down by? You know, well, let's see, $1,400 an hour times 6000 <laughs> Well, we, yeah, we all know attorneys are expensive hours. Yeah, you, got, you got attorneys, you got experts, you right. got filing fees, you got local counsel if you're in the Eastern District of Texas, you, you got appeals, like you got... You I, we, I'm sure we can, we can probably circulate something that suggests how that gets broken I, I, I could break that down in you know, 60 seconds. You know, you, you essentially have, in, in a patent lawsuit, you have the initial pleading stage in which the defendant might try and move to dismiss um, based on various grounds or move to transfer to more, um, a better jurisdiction, minimum cost. You're looking at $60,000 or less, right? Where it gets really expensive is if you have what's, what's called the claim construction hearing. Claim construction is when you're taking the claims of your patent and determining what those words actually mean. So the word the may have a very important mean, meaning in the patent that people like me spend $100,000 arguing about. It is very expensive to go through the claim construction process. After that, you probably have a dispositive motion stage, which is probably equally as expensive. Um, sample case, you know, regular case, Eastern District of Texas, Northern District of California, um, one patent suit, software patent, pretty straightforward. You're looking at initial pleading stage, $50,000 for a regular size firm, 250 for claim construction, uh, experts probably 350 to 500 depending on the case, depending on the technology. Um, then you have discovery, which is the patent is the patentee is asking for all your documents in a very overbroad manner. If you're the defendant, information that you probably don't want to give to someone that is just shaking you down for money, that can cost upwards of 250 to 500 thousand. Trial, one week trial, Northern District, jury consultants. Experts again, you're looking at another five hundred thousand dollars. You're getting to a million five pretty easily, and that's on a pretty straightforward case for a regular sized firm. Where do you, where do you avoid those costs? You work with your attorneys. You don't fight on discovery issues that don't matter. You're smart in terms of how you're handling the litigation, and perhaps you're getting your uh, counsel to agree to some sort of capped fixed fees, in which they're capping. Um, the initial six months before you before discovery starts, before the initial case management conference, where they're saying we're not going to spend more than fifty or sixty thousand dollars, and we're going to basically work with you regardless of how much that costs, to either figure out a solution to this little litigation, an early exit ramp, or determine whether or not this is a case where you should be settling early. So you have to work with your attorneys. They need to understand what your business needs are, but those costs can get really expensive really quickly in order to prevent you from losing your business. And we're not going to fix it here today, but if we keep talking about it, we can force patent holders, when they file complaints in the court system, to be very specific about what they're accusing and how they're reading their claims. Because right now, the courts will accept what we call notice pleading, which basically you just make general allegations about infringement, and you kick off a litigation. So I think what we can do is also reform the court system and make somebody actually tell you how they're reading these claims right up front. Damien? I, I was just going to say, I think even more important than the actual cost uh, is you know, something as an economics major, uh, is the opportunity cost that we're not talking about, right? Is the mind share, the emotional distress you talked about this entrepreneur going through, the things that we are not innovating anymore because we're spending our time defending something that's at the end of the day for us is irrelevant. It's not pushing the agenda forward. It's not pushing tech. It's not pushing innovation. And and not talking about that to me is 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 almost more important that we do talk about that as opposed to the dollar amount. Yes, the dollar amount's huge and, and et cetera. But if, for example, like if we get sued tomorrow for it, I mean, okay, worst case is I gotta go raise more money, right? That's possible. But the time the emotional energy it takes away from me, the employees, and what we're trying to do with the company is, to me, a far greater travesty than the cash. I mean, that, I mean, that's actually a killer point. Um, like, if you can imagine what a week's worth of lead engineer time is worth, I mean, that's what you probably are going to lose on average when they're being deposed. Right. And the way the law is set up, even if you do that and you do fight back and you spend two, three, four years and you spend one point five, two, three million dollars and you win, that, that's it. That's what you have to show for it. Let me make a plea. 
when you get a claim letter from a patent troll, don't hide it. If you hide it, then you're hiding the problem. If you hide it because you don't want the rest of the entrepreneurial community to know that you're under attack, then you're not helping solve the problem for yourself or for others. So we've got all these folks, thousands and thousands of companies, that get claim letters, that go see a lawyer and the lawyer says, oh, you know, ka-ching, six figures, I'm sorry, we don't like to do this, but this is what it costs, I have to eat too. You know, and they're respectable lawyers, they're doing good work for you. And you say, all right, I'll settle. Five grand, eight grand, two grand, no money. Two points of every dollar I ever make, right? A point and a half, half a point, it doesn't matter. You're settling with a troll. You're settling with a guy who is literally leeching off of your business and has now become your partner. And you've let him then go on to the next guy or the next company. And you'll sign an NDA, you'll sign a non-disclosure agreement. So now you can't even talk about it. But if you talk about it before you settle, if you talk about it during the time before you get into litigation, if you send us the claim letter at patents at AppAlliance.org, we'll build a database. We'll help you figure out, we'll work with EFF and we'll work with, with Ancient Advocacy to figure out who the bad guys are. And we'll figure out a way to raise the money to go after them and invalidate their patents or make their lives miserable or frankly, you know, go pick at their freaking house. I mean, I come from a world of politics and you know, public relations, right? The goal is to win. They're playing dirty, I'm more than happy to play the same way. But if you don't tell us that you're getting whacked, we can't help you. If you don't support EFF, if you don't join Engine Advocacy, if you don't join the App Developers Alliance, if you just bury it and sign away, you know, your firstborn and your secondborn and your thirdborn, then you know, you're gonna, your investment's gonna drive anyway because you're now giving away four and a half points to nobody. And they'll just move on to the next person. They'll move on to the next company. You've got to come out and talk about it. Question. So, kind of going on that, it'd be great if there was like, on your website, like a, a flow chart on a personal business level, like within one company, within the greater group. Like a flow chart, it's like, okay, so what do you do about this scenario? So. Like for the greater group, like Stack Exchange said, we can go ahead and if we all invalidate a few patents, it's a good thing. If on, if, what can you do before and then what happens when you get, you know, a claim? Fair point. So, and I know we are working, we're actually in discussions with a whole lot of law schools, with several law firms, with um, companies that are doing things like Stack, where if you can create a public wiki, um, or an opportunity for people to weigh in um, and expose these potential patents, right? Whether they're 22 solid claims or 22 crummy claims, if two million people lay eyes on it instead of two people in the patent office, you're more likely to discover the prior art. You're more likely to create opportunities to, to undermine it down the road. So, the, but the short answer is yes. Are there tools? Um, yes. Do we need to, to make those tools more accessible and more available? Yes, uh, it's point well taken. I would note one thing on that though. It, the tool set is going to be a very specific circumstance base. It's, well, it, 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 it's a tough tool set to develop yeah. because each circumstance is so different. And the reality is, is you know, like we represent a bunch of those companies that we're identified here that get sued a lot. And I have one company that I work for where we get they get at least three patent infringement suits a month. It's I can't I can literally tell you. Well, maybe the same ultimate parent company that's the troll, every single case is different and the strategy is different for each individual one. But that's in an infringement case. If you can do a re-examination that's more generic or a declaratory judgment action that's more generic, then you don't have the risk of the focus being on the infringers or the alleged infringers activity. The focus is back on the patent where it belongs and essentially you're saying this piece of crud never should have been issued in the first place. Uh, so. Yes, um, but there's, we, we've got to find other ways to skin this cat. There's a question over here. Yeah, as I've been listening to all these ideas about how to reform the patent system, I can't help but feeling like I'm listening to the debate over the three-fifths compromise. Um, <laughs> but by talking about how to make a better 
implementation of a fundamentally unjust system, we're sort of legitimizing that unjust system. I think that although it's reasonable to have practical strategy because we live in the real world, whenever we talk about that, we need to remind people that invention, at least in terms of software, is a fictive idea and that the ownership of ideas is an affront to human dignity. We can't just say, oh, it's an implementation problem. So I um, appreciate the theology, um, but unfortunately, we all have to deal, as Damien says, with the world as we're dealt it, at least at the time we're talking. We can all view the opportunity to pursue the ultimate goal with great spirit and raise money around it and create, you know, the Mark Cuban um, chair of crappy patents for stupid patents, right? To eliminate stupid To eliminate stupid patents, patents. <laughs> right. Um, and that's, it's, seriously, it's great. Uh, but we also have to deal with what do you do as a company today if you get whacked? What can we do as an association in support of companies? What can Engine do as an alliance of companies um, on, the, on a day-to-day -day basis um, in addition to pursuing that ultimate goal? Yes, sir. Um, I'm curious whether any of you have spoken with GitHub about trying to create repositories of prior art that are associated with specific uh, commits so that along with the code base, there's actually uh, a, a, a corollary um, place for people to lodge prior art. So if you're going to use a particular open source function and you get sued, you can actually show what the basis it was for using it. So I don't think GitHub's doing anything right now, at least that I know about. Um, I know Google's doing some stuff around this, around prior art searching. Um, no, and I know I'm talking specifically about in the GitHub code base. In the GitHub code. Having it there so that people have access to it and can expand upon it. I actually think that what you, so I don't think that's happening now, but it's a really important point, and we have a problem with an inability to find prior art, particularly from the open source world when it comes up. And it, it, we, I think the problem is that people are looking for it after the fact, and some years, many, many years after the fact. And there's actually so been a lot of litigation it, around this, and unfortunately the Supreme Court came down in a place we didn't like, and we fought them. Um, they make it harder and harder to find the prior art. The prior art has to be really specific. You have to have, you know, prove that the code was actually running in a certain way. That, that's been complicated, but um, I think that, you know, you raise a good point, and there might be something we could do with GitHub. I don't know if they'd be open to it or not, but it's a good idea. Yes, sir. I was wondering, how do patents uh, affect open source software? Like, if you're not a company like Red Hat, you're just an individual developer developing open source stuff, how do patents affect you, and can you be sued? The question is, did somebody invent it before you, or alleged to have invented it before you, right? Yeah. Um, copyright is simpler in many ways. Shakespeare didn't patent, right? He doesn't have a patent on the idea of a love story or a family fight. He didn't have copyrights either. He didn't have, yes. well, but even if he did, you, if you only violated his copyright, only infringed his copyright, if you wrote the same family fight story, exactly or virtually exactly the same way. With patents, if the patent is so broad that it feels really much like an idea, not an invention, then you've essentially patented a family fight story or a love story in a way where anybody who comes along, you can make the assertion, the claim that they have infringed your patent. And that's the challenge of sort of the vagueness and the breadth. So you might think you're using open source code and you're building on top of an open source platform, but your idea or the what you did with it may have made, somebody may say, well, no, I already patented that idea using, you know, whatever, some other code. And also, just to be clear, the law on infringement is, is it's not just, you don't infringe if you, you infringe if you make something, if you sell something, or if you use something. So even if you picked up some open source code from someone else and you're using it, but someone else has a patent that allegedly covers it, you could be on the hook too. Yes, sir, in the back. Great t-shirt, by the way. Thank you. I have a question about uh, trademarks. How do they relate? How are they parallel? Uh, are there trademark tools out there? We're going to be back next Tuesday for the trademark session. Just kidding. <laughs> um, Gary, you want to? Um, OK, yes, indeed, there are trademark trolls. They're not as prevalent as patent trolls. You, uh, the trademark office has the same infection that the patent office has. People are going to the trademark office and getting rights and things like have a good day on your t-shirt, or life is good as their mark, and they wait for people to trip into those spaces. 
uh, by using that phrase in their advertisement. For example, if you're advertising your app and they come after you. Another trick they'll use is to register at a state level because each state has its own trademark registration system. So they'll go register in Puerto Rico or you know New Jersey and wait for you to trip into that. Uh, the trademark protects, uh, it, it's not an invention that it, it's protecting. It's protecting either your logo or your name or your phrase that people have come to associate with your specific product or service. Uh, and I think you're right, that's a whole other a whole other area to get into because in some ways it's simpler, in other ways it's more complex even than the patent system. But we can talk afterwards if you have specific questions. What I want to say, the real question I think that needs to be asked is what can you do now? How can you combat this? And I, I applaud Banjo's effort. They're making themselves dangerous to, to attack by building up their portfolio of rights. And even though some of, most of these trolls don't have a business or a product, they have owners and investors that do. And so at least we have a situation here where we have someone who's building their own space and has a better, frankly, chance of protecting it if they can strike back somebody or an investor in a troll who might you know, suffer should he assert his patents against them. So that's the first thing you should do is protect your space. And I agree with the comment here. There's some, um, there, there's some counterintuitiveness about the patent system, particularly in the software industry, but it's something we have to live with. Uh, the earliest patent system that I've been able to find is 500 BC on the uh, southern tip of the Italian peninsula. There was a patent system, but it required practice, which we don't do, which is unfortunate.